Lord, we're grateful that we as a people can come together to just seek you through your word. And we're grateful for the power of your word. Lord, you, you, you tell us that in your word is that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce through the bone and the marrow and, and Lord, the, the, uh, the, the discernment of, of our hearts, Lord God, and, and that your word, Lord, is alive. That you, Jesus, you say that you are the word, the living word. And so, Father, we know that as we, as we open and read and study and consider the Bible, we're, we're considering you. We're reading about you. So, Father, we're asking today by the power of your spirit, would you become real in our hearts today in the name of Jesus? Amen and amen. Right on. Well, let's open up our Bibles here this morning in um, the book of Revelation in chapter number 10. Guys, we're just going right through it, um, plowing through the book of Revelation. Remember, in uh, the book of Revelation tells us uh, there in chapter number one, right there, that this book, the reading and the study and the meditation on of this book here, Revelation, is that there's a blessing attached to it. And so let's, let's study this with the understanding that, man, we're going to be blessed as we consider the Word of God. You know, and uh, so again, we're in chapter number 10. Last week we were in chapter number 9, obviously. And uh, just in way of reminder, what we were looking at are the, the trumpets that are being blown. And specifically last week, you know, as one of the trumpets was being blown, that, that uh, these, these demonic demonically possessed locusts from the pit of hell was released and, and stinging people that, were, that are here on earth during the time of the tribulation. And for a period of five months, they were unable, they weren't going to die. They were just going to uh, experience this pain, right? And then another trumpet was blown and, and um, a third of man was, was killed, it says, right there. And, and so these judgments are taking place on, on planet earth during the time of the tribulation. Now, again, I want to remind us all, because maybe you haven't been with us in the past several weeks, that what we're looking at here, the book of Revelation is a prophetical book, meaning that it's speaking of future events that will be taking place. And, and I believe here, because I, I believe there's, there's strong biblical evidence that, that says that Prior to the tribulation starting, that there's going to be the rapture of the church will take place. Meaning those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, it will be caught up into heaven. So believers, Christians will be caught up into heaven, meet Jesus in the air. Okay. And it'll be at that time we'll begin this period of the tribulation. Okay. And there's going to be a middle portion of that tribulation, a seven year period. So in that three and a half a year time is when things really are going to begin to happen in the sense of judgments, okay? And this is what we're looking at right now. This is what we're studying right now, okay? And even in what we've been looking at in the past several weeks and these judgments of God, we've also been looking at the grace of God, even in the midst of all the judgments, even in the midst of all these things, because one of the questions that's asked often is that, will people be able to be saved during the time of the tribulation? And the answer is yes. And you see that right there. There's a question kind of asked and, and the, at the end of chapter number six. You know, who then can stand, right? Who can stand? You know, in other words, you know, who's going to, you know, who can stand? Who's going to get saved, right? And it's there in chapter number seven, there's like kind of like a, a parenthetical type of a chapter where we're introduced to 144,000. And, you know, there was this silence in, uh, in heaven and, and really God's mercy being extended. So people will begin, continue to hear the gospel. And yes, they will endure hardships, great hardships at that time. But yet, the, the bottom line is that they're going to be saved. You know, and so that's the important thing. And, and it doesn't mean either. During the time of the tribulation, um, guys, it was what we're looking at right now in this context here in the midst. And remember, it's from chapter number 6 to chapter number 19 is, is this period of the tribulation time. It's not like God is, has lost any control, right? Uh, like, you know, all hell broke loose, you know. Um, it's, God is the one who is in control. Remember, there in chapter number five, even we're, we're told that, you know, the scroll there is in the hand of, of him who sits on the throne. Who is worthy to take the scroll? And it's Jesus, 
right? And Jesus, the Lamb of God, was able to, you know, he is worthy to take the scroll. And he is the one who is um, unraveling the seals. There's seven seals that we looked at. And so he's totally worthy. Meaning, in other words, guys, that God is in complete control. And I love it too because, you know, when, when I'm studying and reading the book of Revelation, I hope and pray that, guys, that for all of us, that we, we are then compelled by the word of God to say, you know what? I want to share the gospel. I want to share this message of the cross with people because without Jesus, people are going to die a second death. In other words, they're going to die separate from God and, and, and not be an eternity in heaven, but be an eternity in hell without Jesus. That's just what the Bible teaches. And so as we study this, may we be compelled and excited and get this passion to say, you know, I want to, I want to not only live my life for Jesus, but I want to talk about Jesus. I want to proclaim the gospel message. Amen. And, and this is what it's all about. And, and here in chapter number 10, Again, we're, there's going to be somewhat of a, a parenthetical type of a chapter, a little bit of a break, you know, um, and some, some insight that we're going to get on this, this giant of an angel, right? And so the, the title of the message today is Sweet and Sour. And the reason why I bring this up is because, well, at the end of this chapter, we're going to see that, the, uh, that John is told to eat the Bible, Eat, or eat the scroll or eat this little book that he sees. And the Bible says that it's going to be sweet in your mouth and, and sour or bitter in uh, your stomach. Have you ever eaten anything sweet and, or sweet and bitter or bittersweet? You know, what kind of a candy? I, I think of dark chocolate. You know, dark chocolate has this bittersweet uh, taste to it. At least that's what the taste is described as, kind of bittersweet. And I like dark chocolate, so that's a good thing, right? But also, you know, it's not just taste. We all go through bittersweet moments of life as well. You know, I was thinking of this just yesterday, some bittersweet moments for, for my wife and I is that, you know, now we've, here lately, it uh, seems as the past uh, few months, we've been uh, kind of just thinking about, wow, all of our kids are adults now. You know, they're adults, they're, you know, doing their life in college and, you know, married with kids and, you know, law enforcement, just doing all, just doing their life. And it's sweet in the sense that we're, we're very pleased with what the Lord is doing in their lives. Like, man, you know, who would have ever thought that our kids would be doing so well, you know, and uh, we're just excited to see that and see them grow and mature and become adults, you know, but at the same time, it's that bitter, like, because my wife and I, we look at each other, man, but we wish they were still five and six, you know, where they act all goofy and they're, they're, they like it when we act goofy now, you know. Like, no, my kids are adults. They, if I act goofy, they look at me like, Dad, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you used to really like this. I'm like, yeah, but not no more, you know. But those are some bittersweet moments, right, that we, uh, that we think of. And again, here in this chapter, we're going to see kind of a bittersweet moment. And that's going to be our, our focus, really, is the, 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 the devouring of God's word, eating it all up. And I think this is something that for us as a church, you know, uh, not just here at Hope Alive, but for, for us to pray about for the church, God's church, God's people, is that there would, that we, there would be a, a righteous hunger for the word of God. You know, and, and we, we look at, in a physical sense, you know, people who are malnutritioned, right? And we see the effects of that, you know, and the unhealthy uh, living and everything that comes with malnutrition. And you don't have to go through starvation to be malnutrition, uh, malnourished. You know, um, it's just eating all the bad foods. You know, we want to, you know, we always talk about physical health or something like that. We always talk about it takes diet and exercise, diet and exercise coupled together, right? A good diet, a good healthy diet and some exercise and, you know, physically you'll be healthy and strong, right? And we want that, you know. Um, some of us, we think of that. If you're like me, I think of that. You know, I think of exercise, you know, the exercise part I think about. It's like, man, well, maybe tomorrow I'll start, you know. But we want that. We desire that. And that's a good thing. But spiritually speaking, for the church and God, for God's people, we, we see that we, it's happening in our church. You know, this malnourished church. And I hope and pray that, that we would say, you know what, what, what is it going to take for us to be healthy, for us to be strong as believers, is for us to take in the whole counsel of God, Genesis to Revelation, right? The whole counsel of God without watering it down. 
without spiritualizing it or anything like that, but also it's going to take the exercise of God's word, taking what we receive and applying, living it out, doing, responding to the word of God. And that's my prayer. That's my heart that we do that. We take it in and then we, we, get, then we, we then get compelled to go out and serve the Lord. And so we're going to be looking at that. And the word of God is bitter, sweet, or sweet and sour in that sense. So let's take a look here. Chapter number 10 with me, please. Um, starting at verse number 1. This is what it says. Then I saw, again, John speaking. He says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud. Listen to the description of this angel. He sees an angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll or a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the servant, uh, excuse me, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. I'm going to stop right there just for a second. And so here's this mighty angel. Who is this angel? The first thing I want to bring us bring to our attention is this, guys. If you have in your mind like a picture of angels, like, oh, angels must be look like little babies with a little diaper sitting on a little cloud playing a harp. You're wrong. Okay, that's not what angels look like. Hello, here we have a description of an angel. He is big, you know, bigger than the jolly green giant, you know. One foot on the sea and one foot on the land. Perhaps in John's vision, it's like the Mediterranean Sea and, and there that part of the Middle East there on land, right? Huge, majestic. And we know this to be the, the case with angels because even a couple of weeks back when we were looking at Gabriel, when he made this announcement, Gabriel the archangel, he, made, he gave this announcement to the shepherds and, and even to, to Mary, right? And their response was that they were afraid, you know? And so he would have to say, hey, do not be afraid. You know, I come with good tidings. I come with good news. And so angels are majestic. But who in particular is this angel? As we look at the description of this angel, it says that he's wrapped in a cloud, right? He, he's, he's got a rainbow over his head and his face was like the sun and uh, his, his legs were like pillars of fire. If you remember back in chapter number one of Revelation, the description of Jesus was very similar here to this angel. Extremely similar, right? And um, some even say that this angel is in fact Jesus. And one of the reasons why some say this, that this is in fact Jesus, is because in the Old Testament, guys, many times in the Old Testament, you'll hear a phrase, the angel of the Lord. And not all the time when you hear that phrase does it mean that it's an appearance of Jesus, which would be a Christophany, okay? But several times it'll say in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord. And there's, a, there's an example of that in the book of Genesis in chapter number 16 um, about the angel of the Lord there with Hagar and Ishmael, okay? And that was a, that was a manifestation of, of Christ, again, which would be known as Christophany. But what I don't think that this is uh, and, you know, that this is Jesus. Now, I could be wrong, okay? I just want to let you, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Now, I'll give you a couple of reasons why I don't think it is. I think the evidence against this angel being Jesus is pretty simple. If you fast forward and look at verse number five of this same chapter, chapter number 10, we're going to get into it, but I want to, to look at this. Um, it says this in verse 5, And the angel, it says, And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and what is in it. And so this angel is actually raising his hands and he's swearing by him who is in heaven. In other words, he's like, you know, um, making this oath here to, here to God. You know, to Jesus, to God in heaven. And so I think there's enough evidence there. Also, in verse number one, see, in this very chapter, evidence against, I, from what I believe, this, this angel to be Jesus. In verse number one, it says here, John, he says that he sees another mighty angel. He says, come down, coming down from heaven. 
coming down from heaven. Now, nowhere in the Bible, okay, there is, there is no reference, there is no Bible evidence that Jesus ever comes to earth in the middle of the tribulation time. And so to, to remind us all what we're studying, what we're looking at from chapters number six to chapters number 19 is the time of the tribulation. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus comes down from heaven in the middle of the tribulation. And so this is, again, I really strongly believe that this is a mighty angel. Many people believe, because there's no name attached to this angel, but many people believe this angel to be Michael. Michael the archangel, all right? And there's a cross-reference in the book of Daniel in chapter number 6, uh, in, uh, excuse me, in chapter number 12, the end of Daniel there, of, of Michael the archangel looking like this and having the same resemblance and doing the same things here as it says in chapter number 10. All right, and you know, as a matter of fact, let me read it to you. In Daniel in chapter number 12, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you like. Daniel chapter number 12, uh, verses six and seven. And this is, this is what it says. It says, then I, Daniel, looked, verse five, actually, looked and behold, two others stood, one on, the, on his bank of the stream and one on the bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of those of these wonders. And then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time that, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And so again, this is a reference to Michael the archangel. All right, so many people believe this to be Michael. It could be, but again, we don't know. Could, could it be Jesus? Yeah, it could, it could be. Now, what we do know is that this is a mighty angel. Let's talk about that. That's what we do know. This is a mighty angel, a big angel. And he comes with authority and power. We, we see that being referenced, this authority and power by him standing on the waters and on the land. So he comes with authority and power and he has a resemblance, an appearance like Jesus. Why does this angel then have this appearance and to, you know, to look like Jesus? Well, he resembles Jesus because he's been in the presence of Jesus. And, you know, I think this is, this is very important for us, guys, in way of application for you and I, because this is possible for you and for me to look like Jesus. Now, we, no one knows what he looks, looks like. There's a lot of people that, you know, think that, you know, this Jesus looks like, you know, he's got these blue eyes and maybe, you know, light brown hair down to his shoulders, kind of a nice groomed and trimmed beard, you know, who knows? But it's more of looking like Jesus in our actions, in our behavior. And we look like Jesus in our actions, in our behavior, and our thoughts, and everything else like that when we spend time with Jesus, when we are in his presence. You know, I think of Moses in the book of Exodus. You know, it says that he wanted to see God right? He want, God, I want more of you. I want to see you. And he, you know, God said, no one can see me and live. But Moses was able to be hidden in the cleft of a rock, right? And Moses was able to gaze upon the glory, the after glory of God. And guys, the Bible tells us that when Moses, you know, after he sees in the presence of God, and he sees the afterglory of God in the presence of God that Moses himself had this Shekinah glory. He was reflecting this glory on himself. So much so it freaked everybody out that he had to wear a veil. You know, it's like, Moses, you're glowing, dude. Glow in the dark. What's going on? You know, you're freaking me out here. He had to wear a veil. You see, it was the presence of God. He was reflecting that. And here, you know, we see this angel looking like being in the presence of God. Well, you and I, too, in the same way can reflect God. It is possible. And how is it possible, you might say? Friends, I will tell you this. The more time, the more time you spend with Jesus through prayer, through his word, 
right? The more, the, the, more you, the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you will look like, the more you will live like, and the more you will love like Jesus. And this is why it's important, as Jesus says there in John chapter number 15, that we abide in Christ. He says, abide in me. When we are abiding and being connected to God, to Jesus, it's talking about this close relationship. We talked about this a few weeks ago for our New Year's uh, uh, um, service, about being connected to God. And when we're connected to him, we're going to be like him. You know, we're going to pray. And then when we pray these things, as the Bible says there in, in chapter number 15, verse number 7, you know, abide in me and, I, and my words abide in you and you will ask anything you want and it will be given. It'll be granted. It'll be given. Why? It's because, well, we have the heart of God. So the more time that we spend with him, it is possible for us to look like him. And this angel, but the focus of this angel, guys, here is not so much his being, Really, as, as it is, really the scroll or the little book that he's holding in his hand. We don't know what this book is. You know, there's a lot of speculation of what it is. It could be, you know, more revelation. It could be the Bible itself. We, we just don't know, okay, exactly what it is. And there is a blessing in not knowing. There's a blessing being attached. As we see here, you know, the angel, as he, you know, he roars, like his voice is like a roaring lion. And then these thunders, seven thunders. And John, is, as it says right there, in verse, I believe it's in verse number three, um, these thunders here, he's able to understand or to articulate what these thunders are actually speaking. And John then goes to write down everything of what he's hearing, perhaps of what's, being, of what's in the scroll. Or that little book, right, is what's being said. And so John's about to write it down. And the angel in heaven is like, hey, stop, you know, stop the presses. Don't write anything down. You're not going to write nothing. So nothing was being written down, you know, and it, but it, rather it was sealed up. In other words, it was really just for John's eyes only, for his eyes only. He, so he's the only one who really knows, you know, there are some things in life that we just don't know. We, you know, when it comes to the things of the, of the word, things of the Bible, you know, we just don't know. Um, my wife, we, we were talking just the other day and, and um, you know, we have some crazy conversations and she was like, um, hey, when you were a kid, did you ever think, you know, did you ever like think of who you were going to marry? And I looked, I was like, why would you bring and I was like, not really, no, you know? Um, you know, I was just like, man, I was like, is this a trick question? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, so I was like, no. But the thing is, like, when you're a kid or, you know, maybe you think of these things, like, you don't know until time goes by, right? Obviously, time goes by. And you, these things are revealed or you have this understanding of, of what's, you know, what it is. But when it comes to divine truths, you know, things of the Bible, there's, cer there's certain things that just have not been revealed yet. We just don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But there's some things that we would like to know, right? It's like, you know, you ever see someone on a phone call or something like that? They've been on the phone call, like, you know, for like 25 minutes, you know, maybe your wife or something like that. And they hang up the phone and, and you're waiting for them to get off the phone. You're like, hey, what'd they say? You know, you want to know. I want to know what, what they say, what was going on. You know, say, hey, it was a personal conversation, you know. But see, but what I'm getting at is that there's things that we want to know. Like, how many of us would like to know when the rapture of the church is going to happen? Right? It's like, hey, is that a bad thing? You know? Maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, I want to know so I can write a book. <laughs> but listen, there's just certain things we just don't know. And I think it's a blessing that we don't know when the rapture of the church is going to happen. Can you imagine? It's like, oh, hey, dude, we got a week, so you're good, you know. Go and live like sinners and all this other stuff, you know. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be authentic. Our faith, our service, our love of God, it really wouldn't be authentic. You see, and Jesus really wants our faith and our love of, of him to be authentic, to be real, to be genuine, Right? But there's blessings. You know, what is the blessing? What is the blessing of not knowing? The blessing of not knowing, especially when it comes to like biblical and divine truths, is it keeps us trusting. The blessing of not knowing these, these things, you know, it keeps us trusting God. 
I, I think of how little kids, you know, I'm talking about little ones. There's a lot of things that they don't know. They don't know what's going on. They might find themselves in, in times, you know, uh, events when they're, they're afraid and they don't know what's going to happen. But when they're, they trust that when they're in the arms of their father or their mother, they're safe. I don't know what's going on. You know, the little four-year-old might not know exactly what's going on, but they know they're safe when they're with mom and dad. They're trusting mom and dad in their presence. I'm okay, right? And so, and I also think of how, you know, there's things that we just don't know here and now, but we will find out later. I remember in the gospel of John in chapter number 13, when Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples, remember that? And Peter was like, Lord, are you gonna wash my feet? Right? What's going on here? And Jesus responded and said, hey, Peter, you know, right now, you don't understand what I'm doing right now until afterward, until you will find out, you will realize, you will understand later. You know, and isn't that the same case with us, like right now? Or maybe you look back at your life five years ago, 10 years ago, you were going through so much heartache, so much challenges, so many things. And you're like, God, what are you doing? You know, but you're trusting the Lord in it. You didn't know what was going on. Why, Lord? Right? But it wasn't revealed until later. And your journey with God, as you continue to trust God, that you look back and say, oh, that's why, Lord, thank you, Lord. That wasn't fun, but thank you, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for these events that took place in my life, this and that and this other thing wouldn't have ever happened to cause me to be here at this place in this stage of my life where I know you and I love you. See, it's not always easy, but in time, you know, God does reveal later in our journey with God. But there's also things that we just, we won't know. You're not going to know until you get to heaven. How many of you have questions for God when you get to heaven? Come on, no lies. Okay, when I get to heaven, I got five questions. You know, you're going to be getting to heaven like, where's the question line? You know, where's, where's it at, you know? I'm telling you this, when you get to heaven, when we get to heaven because of our faith in Jesus Christ, you're not going to have any questions. You know what you're going to do? You're like, oh, so did you have any questions for me? No, I'm cool. <laughs> nah, it was a dumb question anyways, you know. <laughs> Listen to what it says in Revelation and chapter number 19. This is great. And, and again, this is at the end, you know, of this tribulation period and, and what is being said and heard in heaven. It says this. It says, I heard and seemed, uh, and what seemed to be uh, the loud voice, there in chapter 19, verse 1, a loud voice of great multitude in heaven crying out, watch this, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are true and just. True and righteous. For his judgments are true and just. You see, that's going to be the response when we get to heaven. It's going to be like, oh, I get it. I have no questions. You see, so it won't be revealed. So there are some blessings in not knowing. I don't know about you, but I, I'm looking forward to being surprised when I get to heaven. I was like, oh, now I get it. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if you have that, if you're looking forward to being surprised. I am. I'm probably going to be surprised of who's there. Dude, how'd you make it, bro? You know? <laughs> he might smell like smoke, but he made it. Right? And that's a good thing. Well, let's look at five, verses 5 and 7 here as we continue in this chapter. It says, um, and so there's that blessing of not knowing. So we don't know. He, we're told that uh, God said, hey, seal up what, what the seven thunders have said. So do not write it down. We don't know. In verse 5, and the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and, and, uh, and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, and and there would be no that there would be no more delay. So this is the, the declaration of this great mighty angel. 
really, you know, swearing by him who's in heaven, right, by God, that there will be no delay. Underline that part in the book of Revelation there for, for yourself in your Bible. That there will be no delay. Verse 7 goes on to say, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, so that seventh trumpet is yet still to be sounded, right? The mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. The mysteries of God will be revealed. But here, first of all, there would be no more delay. This is, the, again, the declaration of this great mighty angel. You know, he comes on to the scene and declares, uh, really what he's saying there is that that time has run out. Some of your de- uh, uh, translations may say that, that time has run out. Or most of your translations probably say that no more delay. That word there that's in the original language is, is also uh, translates into our English word for um, chronological, right? The idea here, however, is there's going to be no more delay. You know, when we look at our world today and world events and, you know, all the things, I don't know, you've been watching the news lately, right? I don't know if you have and and all these missile attacks and what's going on in our world today. You know, it causes me as a believer and not just globally or internationally, but also locally. And also when I look at the church, when I take an observation at the church as a whole, there's a lot of great things that's going on in the church, guys. Man, the gospel's going out. People are getting saved. But yet there's elements of, of the church, of God's people, really that, that makes us, makes me like my, my heart, my heart hurt. Like, oh no, this is not good. This is not healthy for us as a church. And again, coupled with all the different world events, you know, it really brings me, you know, to this place where we say, Lord, come quickly. There's a, there's a word in the Greek, it says maranatha. That's what it means. Come quickly, Lord. Your kingdom come. We pray that often. People pray that your kingdom come, your will be done on heaven as, and uh, on earth as it is in heaven, right? We pray that. And, and especially, I think, as we, when we look at all these things that's going on in our world. And so here, what this angel is saying, during this time of the great tribulation, right here in this middle period, it's like, okay, there's going to be no more delay. No more delay. It's going to happen, right? It's coming down. It's happening, you know, we, we think of all these things, especially within the church. Guys, I don't know if even, you know, if you follow like things uh, such as like, uh, the, the, like uh, Christian news or anything like um, with Christianity, Christianity Today, you know, coming out with articles and, and everything. And it's just like, you know, uh, embracing, you know, just sexual immorality. And it's not just Christianity Today. There's churches. There's churches in our world that, that embrace, you know, uh, sin. They embrace sin. And it's turn a blind eye to sin. You know, we are all sinners. But just the fact that we're all sinners doesn't make it okay for us to say, well, I'm a sinner. I might as well sin anyways. God loves me. Yes, he does love you. But we should not trample over the blood of Jesus Christ and his grace by deliberately and continuing to live in sin. Because that's sin. Right? Right? We got to look at the love and the grace of God with, you know, with reverence, knowing, yes, we're not perfect, but knowing at the same time, God, I I need you and cry out to him, right? But there's a lot of things that's going on in our church uh, people and and church movements and and, uh, organizations that are just, you know, oh, well, it's okay. Turn a blind eye to it. And may we never find ourselves in that place where we turn a blind eye to it. But, you know, that God reveals sin in our own life. And let me tell you something. That's one thing powerful about God's word. He reveals sin in our life so that we would confess of it. We're going to look at that in here in just a second. But I like it here. He's saying no more delay right now and, and where, where we're at in our world and at this age of grace right now. We are experiencing the grace of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9 that, that God's, you know, don't count God's slackness as, you know, um, as slackness, you know, but it's, it's patient, his, he is being patient with you and with me, not wanting or desiring that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, you know, that's the, that's the heart and the desire of God for every single one of you. I can't just be here, guys, and just assume that every single one of us are saved. 
that every single one of you are going to be in heaven when you die. I can't, I can't just assume that. I would like to. But I want you to know that if there's sin gripping your life, I want you to know God loves you. He loves you and he desires for you to come to a place where you realize his love, that you would repent. And we do that by looking at his grace, by looking at his mercy, by looking at what he did on the cross for us so that you would have the promise of eternal salvation. You see, and this, this is God's gracious patience toward us that's holding back at this period of time that we're in, holding back these judgments. And that's love. That's love for you. And that's love for people that you love as well, that you're praying for. Because I'm sure there's people that you know that you're praying that would come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And then he goes on to say here, and look at it, uh, there at verse number, um, verse number eight, that the mystery of God would be fulfilled. Right, And again, this seventh trumpet that has yet to be blown and it said this is going to be revealed. Right, The mystery of God will be then revealed. Now, mystery is used often in the, in the Bible. There's one place I think of, you know, there in Ephesians in chapter number three where it's the mystery of the gospel is being revealed. Right, And the purpose of the gospel, the purpose of why Jesus came into this world, you know, so that there would be, you know, God's people and, and so that we would, you know, have the promise of eternal life. And so that mystery is being revealed, but it's not a mystery in the sense that we, no one can ever figure it out. It's oh, the idea of mystery in the Bible means that no one can know unless it's been revealed. No one can truly know unless it has been revealed. And, and let me tell you something, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit through us, through you and through me, as we declare the gospel message, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that reveals the mystery of the gospel to people. To understand, man, I understand why Jesus went to the cross. I understand that he rose again from the dead. And I understand his love for me. You see, and it's the mystery of God being revealed. And so that's being revealed by, through the power uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit. But this particular mystery here that has yet to be revealed, that's speaking again of future events as we're in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 um, there, uh, meaning this could be, uh, may be, a, may be a truth concerning God that has not yet been revealed, but will be revealed at this time. That's what that mystery could be. And again, we don't know because it hasn't been revealed yet, right? All right, we get it. We understand. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to close here now with these next a few verses. Verses 8 through 11. It says this. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go, take the scroll that is, that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land, so I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll or the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter, but your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little book or the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when, it, when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And so there he was compelled then to go. But let's take a look here. He ate it up. It was sweet and sour. What did he eat? The words, right? The scroll, the little book, these words that came from heaven. He ate it all up and it was sweet and sour or bitter. Now, this is, guys, this is not the only, you know, I, honestly, when I was going through this, and, and, um, and again, I wasn't going to eat my Bible, but I started thinking about it. I was like, man, what if God told me right now, hey, Tommy, I want you to eat this. I'll probably go get some tapatio or something. <laughs> you know, you should kind of think about that. But because it's kind of like, wow, Lord, he ate, he ate it, you know? But it's not the first time in, in, in Scripture where someone has eaten the scroll or eaten the words that were written on a piece of paper. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, in chapter number three, you can write this down. I'll read it to you if you like. It says uh, in chapter, actually at the end of chapter number two, starting at verse number nine, it says this, and, uh, and this is Ezekiel speaking. And when I looked, behold, when I looked, 
behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And he said to me, chapter 3, verse 1 of Ezekiel, and he said to me, son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, son of man, feed, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it. And it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. I want you to notice there, because we're going to look back, and uh, that, that as he ate the word, as he took it all in, he was then compelled or instructed, now you go, you go and tell. And, and excuse me, in Jer Jeremiah chapter number 15 is also a reference there where Jeremiah also ate of the written word that was written on a scroll or there of paper. Okay, so he ate the word. So let's get back here to Revelation. He ate this scroll, this little book. He ate it and it was sweet and sour. He ate it all up. He ate it all up. He took it all in. And I think, guys, for us here in a practical sense, for us as application time, that it's important for us to take in the whole word. It's important for us to look at the Bible and to take it all in. Not just the parts of the Bible that we like. The sweet parts, right? All the wonderful promises of God, you know, we like to take those in. You know, there's promises of God as well that says that, hey, you know, we're going to suffer. How many like those for his promises, Right? <laughs> no, it's like, no, I don't like that promise. But it's important that we take it all in, that we have it all. To take, you know, the Bible says this, guys. When we partake of the Lord, the best, most effective way for us to partake of God is through his word. And the Bible also tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. In other words, taste and see. It is sweet to our mouth. You're going to enjoy it. Why is it that we enjoy it? What is it that we enjoy? Well, I think what we enjoy is the precious um, assurance of our salvation. You know, there's other places in the Bible that says that, um, that God's word is like honey. Turn with, with me real quick to Psalm 119. In verse number 103, I want you to see this so that you can underline it in your Bibles as well. Psalm 119, right there smack in the middle of the Bible, verse number 103. And this is what it says. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's what he says. How sweet are your words, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Underline that, circle that, and let that encourage, let that verse encourage you right there of taking God's word in. Again, what is it that is sweet about God's word? It is his precious promises and assurance of salvation. That is sweet to the soul. But friends, when we consume of God's word, again, we should be consumers of God's word, taking it all in. And what is it about God's word that makes it sweet and sour? Well, when we take in God's word, we're not told just to take it in and, you know, uh, get all the sweetness out of it and then spit it out. We are instructed to take God's word in and digest it. Right? Take it all in. Consume it. Digest it. And it's when this, di the, the digestion of God's word is what oftentimes bring, brings this bitterness, this sour taste, if you will, or this bitterness that goes on in our stomachs. And what is this bitterness then? You know, again, it's not so much talking, I don't wanna, we're not talking about so much of our taste, but to the soul, God's word. It is sweet 
the assurance of our salvation. The bitterness, friends, will be the fact that many will die without Jesus. Because as when we have the word of God, as we realize salvation is only found in God, right? And that is sweet because we have this assurance, but then we realize like, oh my goodness, there's people in my family. There's my wife. There's my husband. There's my children. There's my mom or my dad. There's people I love. They're not going to go to heaven. And it brings this bitterness to us. So there's that aspect of the bitterness. There's the, even the persecutions and the hardships that we go through as Christians. Again, the Bible doesn't promise us, you know, a life with a cherry on top. You know, we go through stuff, right? And so these, these persecutions that we go through and challenges and heartaches and the judgments that are even yet to come, this, this brings bitterness in our hearts. The word, now listen, friends, please. We're just about done here. The word, the word completely in us, the word completely in us will cause us to care. Again, looking at Ezekiel, he ate it all up and he went. He had this concern and this care. The word in us will cause us to care. You'd begin to care because you'd understand the demise for those who aren't saved. You'd have this concern. And this is only it's the word of God that does that, that brings this concern or this kind of care in our hearts for the things of God and for the, for the love of the lost the concern for those who are lost. And this is the reason why we are about our church here at Hope Alive. What we're about is, man, we want to be built up. We want to be encouraged. We want to partake of God's word, the sweet and the bitterness part, so that we can then be compelled to go out into our local community. Like what we did last week, out into our community, just sharing the word. Yeah, we had toys that we gave out, but we wanted to pray with people. I don't know if you're, you know, for those of us that were there, yeah, we were really busy, but there was times we were praying with people. Kids were getting saved. I had the privilege of leading a couple of kids to the Lord. Gabriel was praying with people. We were all praying with people individually. Why were we doing that? We were, we care, just like you. And that's what God really would have for us to do is for us to have this kind of care. The word is powerful. When we completely take in the word, my friends, listen, because some of you might even be asking the question, how come I'm, I don't have this kind of concern? Oh, well, maybe God wants you to take more of his word in because the more of the word of God that you take in, the more that you will be compelled to go and speak. Like what happened with Ezekiel and also look at chapter 10, verse number 11, right there. It says here, the angels, he tells them, he says, uh, uh, and I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples. You must, you must go. And it's not more of like, hey, you gotta go, but it's like, man, I must go. I, I can't not go. Compelled. You know, the word in you will compel you to go and speak and to share. And there's nothing like my friends, being a Christian, being driven by the word of God. And that's for all of us, for all, for you and for me, to be driven by the word of God. Two things I want you to write down as we close. This is it. As a result of the sweet and sourness of God's word, two things as a result of the complete digestion of God's word. Number one, you'll have compassion for people. Number one result, you'll have compassion for people. Not just the salvation, but the well-being for people as well. Okay? And that's important. The well-being of people is important. Number one, salvation, but the well-being as well. The second thing, that uh, as a result of the complete digestion of God's sweet and sour word, is that... God's word brings conviction of our own sin. And that's much of the bitter part. The conviction of our own sin in life. Again, none of us are perfect. We have areas of life where we are challenged. 
But God loves us enough that God will use his word to shine in those areas of our lives where God would say, hey, would you confess and repent of that today? And that's a work of God. He wants us to grow in that way. Amen? Father, Lord, we love you and we are grateful for your majesty. We're grateful for your living word. We're grateful, Lord, that we as, as a group of people can be here in this place and we can study the word. We can grow in our understanding of your word. And we can apply your word, Lord. You're, we can live out your word. Father, your word is sweet in revealing to us our salvation. And Lord, we know that at times your word is also sour, revealing to us areas of our own lives where we need to confess our sin. It draws us to have a concern and a care for people that are lost in their sin. And Father, we pray that we would all, I pray, Father, for all of us to be filled with your spirit, that we would say, you know, there's my husband or my wife or my children, there's someone close to me that does not know the Lord. But Lord, they need to know you. We lift those people up to you right now, Lord, that you would convict them of their sin, that they would be drawn to you as their Savior. We love you, God, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.